And with that, I'd like to introduce Brian Kavanaugh. He is the Senior Vice President of American Global Strategies. Brian was the former US National Security Council member at the White House for President Trump and Biden. He's been a special assistant to president and senior director for resilience policy, as well as the executive director for strategic planning with Homeland Security before coming to American Global Strategies as a senior vice president. Brian. Good morning, and it's great to be here in person uh, with all of you today. It's definitely a change from the last several years. <laughs> Thank you, Bryant, for the warm introduction, and thank you to Gerard and the leadership team at the GBA for allowing me to speak with you guys today. As we open this two-day event, uh, Blockchain Infrastructure, Building Blockchain for Government, I find myself inspired by the mission of the GBA to serve as a facilitator, bringing together all levels of government with various industries to enable efficient, ethical, and rational adoption of blockchain technology with the goal of increasing our quality of life and strengthening our collective resilience. Nature abhors a vacuum. As the saying goes, and if our critical infrastructure owners and operators fail to evolve and revolutionize their approach to operations and security, we will jeopardize the very assets, systems, facilities, and networks our modern society has come to rely on every day, in nearly every aspect of our life. Disruptions to our critical infrastructure and the services they provide to society have very dangerous consequences, not just for the United States, our national security, and our economic security, but for our allies and partners around the world. And that is why I want to talk to you today about a couple of points. Number one, the threats to critical infrastructure, the vectors, who, who's challenging us. Number two, some thoughts on how we address current challenges to the resilience of that infrastructure. And number three, how public-private partnerships can drive innovation in this important field. Another saying, let's walk and chew gum at the same time. We can and must address these vulnerabilities of our critical infrastructure, but we can't do it in a way that undermines our innovation. We should embrace emerging technologies in a responsible manner to strengthen the resilience and revolutionize how we do business. In looking at the U.S. 2021 national, I'm sorry, interim national security guidance, it reaffirms the 2017 national security strategy's description for a new era of great power competition. Foreign nations have begun to reassert their influence regionally, globally, and they are contesting the geopolitical world order. I'm going to elaborate on that for a few moments. So, <laughs> China and Russia challenge democracies influence governments at all levels, and manipulate or disrupt mar markets on a global scale. They're determined to make economies less free, less fair, to grow their militaries, and to control information and data, to repress their societies and expand their influence. At the same time, transnational threat groups, from jihadist terrorists to transnational crime or criminal organizations, are actively trying to harm Americans, as well as citizens of other democratic nations. While these challenges differ in nature and magnitude, we are finding similarities in their targets of opportunity. Increasingly, they're focusing on the systems, assets, and nodes of our civilian critical infrastructure. Over the past two decades, while America was focused on countering terrorism, our adversaries had shifted their focus. It's now undeniable that the homeland is no longer a sanctuary. Recognizing the serious challenges presented in a traditional military conflict with the United States, this new era emphasizes attacks on our citizens, malicious cyber attacks against our personal, commercial, or government infrastructure, or political and information subversion, otherwise known as foreign malign influence. New threats to commercial and military uses of space are emerging as space takes on a larger role in increasing digital connect connectivity to all aspects of our life, business, government, and military, continually creating significant vulnerabilities. We live in an era where attacks against our critical defense, government, and economic infrastructure must be anticipated. 
the security environment is also affected by rapid technological advancements and changing character of warfare. To drive and develop new technologies is relentless with ever-expanding accessibility, lower bars to entry, all while moving at an accelerated speed. New technologies include advanced computing, big data analytics, artificial intelligence, autonomy, robotics, directed energy, hypersonics, and biotechnology, the very technologies that will ensure our connected and operational critical infrastructure. New, new commercial technology is changing society, critical infrastructure, and ultimately the character of warfare. The fact that many technological developments come from the commercial sector means that state competitors and non-state actors alike will have access to them, a fact that risks eroding conventional over, overmatch to which America has grown accustomed. It is important to understand the goals and objectives are, of our greatest geopolitical rival with respect to technology. That is the People's Republic of China and the Chinese Communist Party that governs it. Chinese President Xi Jinping has made, committed to spend $1.4 trillion by 2025 under the Made in China 2025 initiative to surpass the United States economically and achieve global domination of high-tech industries like robotics, advanced information technology, aviation, and electric vehicles, as well as critical technologies including quantum computing, artificial intelligence, and autonomous systems. As of 2018, nine of the top 20 global technology firms were already based in China, and Beijing is aggressively subsidizing national champion firms with the goal of increasing that number. If we were only talking about friendly competition between two allies or two neutral parties, we could be less concerned. However, we've seen enough from Beijing to know that this is not the case. In the US, China is exploiting what they access, what, I'm sorry, in, in the US, China is already exploiting access they do have to gain leverage over the United States from media and entertainment to sports teams to individuals. But concerns about China's expansion of tech capabilities have expanded beyond the ability to steal personal data from websites or devices and into our critical infrastructure and military capabilities. How do they do this? China's University of Science and Technology has claimed last year to have built the world's fastest programmable quantum computer. It's supposed to be 10, 10 million times faster than its closest competitor. If these claims pro prove to be true, and China gains lead in this capability, our secure military and intelligence communications, encrypted services for financial te technology transfer, and how we operate critical infrastructure will be put at significant risk. During my time in the National Security Council, we worked hard and often against the current to successfully withdraw from the Open Skies Treaty in November of 2020. The international community struggled to fathom why the United States would leave this treaty, a treaty originally proposed by President Eisenhower, and for the long time, the US championed this with 34 treaty members. What happened? The United States recognized in addition to gaining in, in addition to gaining, yeah, <laughs> this is the struggle after driving in all day. Um, well, what, what happened is the United States recognized that in addition to not being able to obtain access to parts of Georgia, where we believed Russian forces were gathering, an even more troubling development existed. There was a dramatic shift in Russian intelligence gathering. During the flights over the United States, a noticeable shift was was made. The intelligence community assessed a major violation of the treaty. The intent of Open Skies was to allow mutual aerial observation of military forces, their movements, in an effort to better understand what is happening in a country to avoid unnecessary escalations based on misconceptions. However, Russia had increasingly been using the flights to not observe military forces or their movements, but rather to enhance their understanding of our critical infrastructure, its interconnected nature, and the vulnerabilities of our system. Significant mapping had been done of things like pipelines, the energy grid, telecommunications routes, and fiber optic cabling. 
This highlighted the strategic shift in planning by Russia, one where civilian infrastructure would be targeted at the outset of a conflict. This targeting of civilian infrastructure would be used as a means to either gain an upper hand early in a conflict or to, in some misguided way, deter a military conflict. And yet another example, just two weeks ago, the Department of Justice announced charges against three Iranian individuals who are alleged to have launched cyber attacks against the United States and other global infrastructure. The efforts of this group hammered home the vulnerabilities of civilian infrastructure and how the use of cyberspace <clears throat> is growing increasingly accessible. These individuals did not carry out attacks on behalf of the Iranian government. However, the government tacitly allowed the attacks targeting healthcare, transportation entities, utility companies, and state and county governments to take place. It had been described by DOJ officials that these state-affiliated actors were working on the side, moonlighting for cash. Their day job was to work for the Iranian government as hackers. With these real-world examples serving as the backdrop, it is important for critical infrastructure owners and operators to understand the role they play in securing tomorrow. Gone are the days of conventional battlefields with warfighting occurring on distant shores. In today's connected society, the fight is brought to your community and to your doorstep via digital means, zeros and ones. Maintaining that security and resilience of our critical infrastructure requires changes to industry, culture, investment prioritization, and strengthening of public-private collaboration and partnerships. Blockchain can be an important piece of a layered security approach that organizations should consider to help protect critical data and operations. However, newer and more agile and innovative companies are struggling to compete with traditional government vendors. While blockchain presents an opportunity beyond the financial technology use cases, there is a need to establish the criteria by which blockchain solutions can be evaluated and aligned with the appropriate use cases, creating an environment that enables a level, level playing field for all innovators to connect and offer legitimate solutions to governments will be born out of establishing standards and identifying requirements. Collaboration and partnerships between private and public sectors will be key in unlocking the potential and ensuring solutions to put forward align with unique challenges faced across the various infrastructure sectors. I like to think of security and resilience as an always moving target. Achieving resilience denotes arriving at a destination. In this era of evolving technologies and seemingly endless innovation, resilience as a destination is only achievable if the infrastructure is static and not evolving or adapting to innovation. Resilience is something we must strive for each day and understand that each innovation, each advancement opens the door for both new and potentially unrealized vulnerabilities or even mitigation. Blockchain solutions, I believe, represent a potential for innovative mitigation to a rapidly advancing Internet of Things, quantum computing, and even AI. The Government Blockchain Association has taken on a great leadership role through the Blockchain Maturity Model, or BMM. The BMM seeks to close the gap for enterprises who are confronting security and resilience challenges I've highlighted today. Developed by a diverse collection of individuals from government and private sector with experience across the board as chief information officers, technical officers, engineers, auditors, executives, and even managers, the BMM provides the process for establishing continually improving blockchain solutions, demonstrates the ability of blockchain solutions meet industry standards, and provides the informa information necessary for acquisition professionals to evaluate blockchain solutions something I believe is critical as we move forward. The incorporation of domain-specific requirements by GBA's blockchain maturity model further demonstrates the ability to tailor this tool and refine the solution set achieved. For example, voting blockchain solutions may have unique requirements, including the separation of voter identity from voter selection and the need for election results to be released in a very efficient and specific time accordance as laws vary across the country and across the world. Beyond the BMM and other efforts underway, Government Blockchain Association serves as a facilitator between the innovators pioneering technology and those who are confronting the persistent challenges and disruption to our critical infrastructure and government entities. 
These connections form partnerships which will drive tomorrow's developments and how we identify and implement blockchain technology to secure our advances. Our, our tech companies must have the freedom to lead in a way conducting groundbreaking research and development activities in critical infrastructure fields, yet their work relies on relationships and information sharing from the owners and operators of those critical infrastructures. <clears throat> the threats described today to our private sector and tech partners renew, should call for renewed emphasis on insider threat programs and operational security. There are examples out here today where algorithms and open source data can assist in closing the gap between intellectual property theft and understanding the risks inherent with personnel. Companies as well as governments should reevaluate how they conduct business with regards to personnel security and IP protection. In closing, in this era of great power competition, we must take steps that ensure we strengthen national security through critical infrastructure resilience. To secure U.S. critical infrastructure, it will take hard work, creativity, and perseverance. But there are attributes that fueled America's rise from the very beginning and helped us achieve global economic technology leadership over the decades. Our national security and future of our freedoms depend on the private sector and the partnerships with public entities. As you guys continue through this two-day event, I look forward to great dialogue. You have excellent speakers on panels, and this should be a very fruitful two days. Thank you for your time this morning, and may God bless America. Thank you.